In 2012, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that states could opt out of a key component of the Affordable Care Act, the requirement to cover more poor Americans through Medicaid expansion. We're in South Central Florida, about 45 minutes west of Orlando, to meet Denise Wade. Denise and her husband, Barry, were living the good life. Good jobs, insurance, house. They didn't realize how vulnerable they were. But despite assurances that the federal government would largely fund the expansion, more than 20 states opted out. Florida is one of them. Hi. Hi are you Denise? Yes, I am. Hey, I'm Josh Rushing. Very nice to meet you. Please nice to meet in. you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. In 2005, Denise Wade and her husband Barry moved to Florida to help her aging parents. They had solid careers in financial security. Fairy tale wedding, huh? It was. It really was a fairy tale wedding. What was he like? Well, he was very um, assertive. He was very, he was an extrovert. He was very gregarious. He would give you the shirt off his back. In the economic downturn, Barry lost his job and health insurance. And then he was diagnosed with cancer. Their ideal life quickly fell apart. The Affordable Care Act was supposed to help people like Denise. But like millions of others, she's caught in a health care coverage gap with no access to affordable insurance. If we'd have had the opportunity to have found out that he had the cancer earlier than we did, I feel certain that he'd still be with us today. But we just did not have the finances or the medical coverage, and so the, the way it went. I always had health insurance. We always had great health care coverage. And then uh, now to be on the, the other side of the fence, it's uh, mind boggling. It's, I never imagined myself in the position that I'm in right now. When he passed away, do you remember like how much you still had in medical bills at that point? Well over 100,000. It was quite an ordeal. Quite so in a fairly ordeal. short amount of time, you went from a couple where he owned his own business, you had a job, you had a retirement fund you were saving We had for. just built a house. We had, we literally had a house built and... Uh, and in a fairly short amount of time, you went from that to... <laughs> rags. <laughs> Richest of rags. Yeah. By the time Barry passed away, Denise was bankrupt. Then she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And being indigent, I'd be completely on the streets without my parents. With the help of charity and her parents' retirement savings, Denise had a lumpectomy, but her health problems didn't end there. Before she even got the cancer, she had had three fibroids removed, one as large as the size of a softball. And um, now, recently, we took her to uh, the, uh, the hospital one night, and they found more fibroids growing again and a cyst on each ovary. This isn't even half of what, well, it is half. My organizational skills have left me. I used to be much more organized than I am now, but. Denise says she needs a hysterectomy to reduce the risk of malignancy, but she can't afford it, and her family's resources are overstretched. Her brother David has Parkinson's, can't work, has no insurance, and also depends on his parents. I was in a motorcycle accident back in um, 86 that uh, I had compressed vertebrae and a compre compressed fracture to my back. Uh, I was on p pain medication for a while until they uh, they changed the laws in Florida where you couldn't get your medication, so, but so much pain medication from a regular doctor and you had to go to pain management, uh, which I cannot afford because I don't have Medicaid. Both David and Denise have applied for Medicaid in Florida three times and were denied, even though they live below the poverty line. Are you in pain now? Oh, yes. Yes, I can't sit for too long, too long a period of time. I can't stand or walk for too long a period of time. That's just, that's just with my back. There's like a tremor there, too. Yeah, that's, yeah. Parkinson's. that's the Parkinson's. What started out as a budget for two became a budget for four. Now, do the math. 
Denise's father, Bernard, also has Parkinson's, increasing the strain on the family. I, all I can tell you is that our investments that we have put in for us, we draw from it every month just to make the monthly bills, including the, all the illnesses. How does that make you feel? It, it saddens me. It saddens me. And it makes me, unfortunately, feel guilty. Although I didn't ask for this health problem, um, I watched my parents work all their lives for what they had. And to know that I'm a drain or a burden on them really hurts. And um, I'm the, the caregiver for all of them. I do all the dispensing of the medications and everything because they're very difficult and easy to get mixed up. And it's getting to the point now where I can't even handle it all. I think, it, I, I think that it's anger because it's hurt. It hurts me to see my family in this condition. Denise and David are two of the estimated 800,000 people who would be covered in Florida if the state expanded Medicaid. The ACA was meant to cover people like them. In the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid, it was redesigned to cover all low-income people in the country, not just selected groups of low-income people. It's totally paid for federally for the first three years, and then the federal contribution stays very high, stays at 90%. Um, a number of states resisted. The resistance has enraged many people in those states who say that Republican leaders are rejecting Medicaid expansion because it's part of President Obama's signature legislation. Rural citizens dying shouldn't be soldiers of our legislature's defiance. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that you had a, a, a strong rightward shift in the country, um, a very, very strong presence of um, a group of people who may be small in numbers, but who are very, you know, electrifyingly present as voters and organizers. Um, who is that the Tea Party? Yes, who oppose all government spending, really, for anything, it appears. Nearly two million Georgians lack health coverage. You are putting at jeopardy the health care of the citizens of Alabama. A level of opposition to the point at which um, those who hold these beliefs are willing to put the lives and health of thousands of state residents on the line to further a belief. Here in North Carolina, where the Republican-led state government voted against Medicaid expansion, citizens have organized into a growing movement. It's time for our leadership on this issue to put down their swords and do what is right. Reverend Barber is a leader in the Moral Monday Coalition. Medicaid expansion is at the forefront of its agenda. When Medicaid was denied here, some people hear that as stopping those who don't deserve, i.e. black folk and brown people. Our movement is exposing that and saying, wait a minute, when you deny 500,000 people Medicaid in a state that has 1.6 million poor people, 600,000 children, you're hurting black people, you're hurting white people, you're hurting poor people, you're hurting Republicans, you're hurting Democrats, you're hurting everybody. Yes, can you take, we're going to open up under that tree. It's lobby day in North Carolina, and people impacted by a lack of health care access are meeting with their representatives. Well, there are about thousands of signatures of people who want Medicaid in North Carolina to Speaker Tillis' office. He's the Speaker of the, of the uh, House here in the state. He's also one of the main opponents to allowing Medicaid money to come in. Over 30,000 petitions you've collected. Here you go. Wait, there's more. There's more. Here you go. A majority of North Carolina state legislators, including Senator Neil Hunt, oppose expanding Medicaid. We're here to discuss the Medicaid expansion. Leaving an estimated $2 billion a year untapped. I, it doesn't make sense to me that we could be covering 500,000 more people in this state, that they could actually get health care, and that we would refuse it. And During the meeting, Senator Hunt listened, uh, okay. but did not respond to their concerns. There's really no single policy that the state could pass that would have a greater impact on alleviating poverty than expanding Medicaid. 
Um, we know it would save lives. We know that it would you know, put so many more people on um, financially secure footing. Um, but the political dynamics make it very difficult um, for Republicans in the state. And now, most recently, we have a Republican governor. Um, so it's, it's difficult for them running in really safe conservative districts to support Medicaid expansion, and then they get painted as a supporter of President Obama, as a, a supporter of the Affordable Care Act. We're fighting for our health care. We shall not be moved just like a tree. North Carolina and the other states that have rejected Medicaid expansion could reverse their decisions and accept the federal funds at any time. The Moral Monday movement has rallied thousands of people and engaged in public acts of civil disobedience to put pressure on their legislators and Governor Pat McCrory. They've come to read a letter to the governor. There's about a dozen or more that have said they will be arrested if that's what it takes. Yes. a lifelong health access advocate who passed away from cancer at just 53 last June. Yeah. Due to a gap in health insurance coverage through which she could have found the cancer earlier, I dedicate this to all people in our state and this nation who are in that predicament. Officers here, you would come on. The Capitol is closed down as normal hours now. The police are starting to move people out. They're starting to move the media out. But there are a dozen or so protesters that will stay until they talk to the governor or they will be arrested. Those who stayed behind were arrested and cited for trespassing. The governor never responded to their letter. Like in North Carolina, Texas leaders have also rejected the federal funds for expansion. We traveled there to see what it means for the state with the nation's highest rate of uninsured. Texas was among the first states to say no. Uh, today I stand with Senator Cornyn, Senator Cruz, Congressman Barton, and Congressman Burgess to repeat our stance, Texas will not be participating in Medicaid expansion. Would you consider expanding a broken system? Of course not, of course not. It's like a drug dealer. You give them your first hit free, and then they're hooked for years and years. In Galveston, on the state's Gulf Coast, 22% of the population lives below the poverty line, well above the national average. In 2008, Hurricane Ike devastated the poorest communities here. Some people lost everything they had and never fully recovered. An eight-foot wall of water flooded this entire part of the island and took this neighborhood, which was historically a very poor neighborhood, and really exacerbated all the social problems it had to deal with, making the job for St. Vincent's house that much more difficult and that much more important. St. Vincent's student-run free clinic in Galveston has long been one of the primary health care options for low-income residents in Southeast Texas. We don't actually do the actual mammograms here. In states that don't expand Medicaid, there are more than 5 million people who don't currently qualify turn to the left and aren't eligible for a reduced price plan in the marketplace, creating a phenomenon referred to as the coverage gap. Uh, like tonight is Dr. Beach and a couple of uh, dermatologists. Kathy Owen, who has chronic pain from nerve damage and a family history of colon cancer, falls into that gap. So how are you doing? I'm halfway there, um, get, gathering the money to have a colonoscopy done, because that's becoming very obvious that I'm in, in trouble, as you know. And how long do you think it'll be before you'll, you can get the colonoscopy? Another month. It took me a month to get halfway, so it's my guess. But I'm, I'm, Kate and I are on the verge of losing our home. Um, so I'm just, I'm peddling as fast as I can right now. But other than that, it's the neuropathy, it's the nerve pain all the time. What we can do here at St. Vincent's is, is good, but it's limited. 
we have to be the people who say there is a treatment for this. You might be able to get it if you were insured um, or if you had access to Medicare or Medicaid, but I'm sorry because of your financial situation you're not going to be getting this surgery or you're not going to be getting this chemotherapy. After her appointment, Kathy told us that her poor health prevents her from working full time. I have peripheral neuropathy, which really is kind of a junk term for nerve damage. Mm. Um, it has gotten really bad in the last couple of years. It's kind of like walking in an ant bed that someone also set on fire all the time, 24-7. How would your life be impacted if you had Medicaid? Uh, I, I could have tests run that I need to have run. So $8,000 stands between me and maybe another 20 years of my life if I have colon cancer. But I find myself now at 53 with grown kids in serious need of help hard to ask for, but absolutely necessary. With some of the most restrictive Medicaid eligibility guidelines in the country, it's always been hard for poor Texans to get health care coverage. Usually I eat out yeah, instead of eating there. As an adult without dependent children, David Booth doesn't qualify for Medicaid. He gets some of his medicine here in the parking lot of a local church where volunteer doctors and med students provide a small selection of donated medications. I have something called partial complex seizures. It means it's non-convulsive seizures. I can slur my words. I can walk like I'm intoxicated. Uh, just imagine, have you ever woken up and you got out of bed too quick? Okay, that's how I feel about half the time. And it just beats my body down. Because of his seizure disorder, David told us he can't find full-time work. I do a lot of construction work. If I go to a regular company, they will not hire me. Seizures, they do not, a plant will not hire me. What I can do is just get day labor work, or I might get a little paint job or, you know, remodeling job. So you can't get enough work to maintain rent? Correct. I'm homeless now. I just want to see a neurologist. I can't afford it. There is no safety net. It's a free fall. And nobody's there on the bottom to catch you. We tried to talk to Texas Governor Rick Perry about Medicaid expansion in his state, but his office declined an interview. Instead, we spoke with the health care policy director at a think tank that has close ties with the governor. We are definitely opposed to the ACA. The free market would be able to meet the needs of the people so much better. The opposition to Medicaid expansion, in your mind, more ideological or fiscal? I don't know that I can separate the two. It is, uh, we believe that our ideology would produce a system that would be less costly. I do believe that we have a uh, we must maintain a safety net. Part of my issue with Medicaid is it is not a sustainable program. The costs are just eating us alive. But for the next several years, the U.S. government will be paying 100% of the expansion. Uh, and do we really trust that? Well, if they did change it, Texas would have the ability to opt out. But a lot of other states seem to be negotiating with how the money is used with the federal government. None of those states optional plans that they're putting forth uh, alleviate the requirements that cause Medicaid ultimately to be a broken system. And I think we have a responsibility to reform that program in a way that it will be sustainable. But in the meantime, would you stop that money that's there from Washington from reaching those Texans that believe that they're in need? That money is an entitlement program that traps people into a, a state of dependency. Yeah, I think that there is a, a lot of uh, denial in Texas, I suspect it's elsewhere as well, of how many people can work and work full time and still have a poverty level income. You know, most of these uh, adults who are left out and most of these households are working households. Health policy analyst Ann Dunkelberg says that Medicaid expansion 
not only helps working families, but also makes economic sense. Texas would benefit from a net gain of over $6 billion a year in new federal health care dollars flowing through the economy on average over the first four to ten years of the project. So it's a huge fiscal stimulus to the state. Taxpayers don't get a break on their federal income taxes because we've chosen to leave six billion dollars a year on the table. Many health care providers say Medicaid funds are critical to reduce the strain of treating the uninsured. Hospitals alone spend more than $45 billion a year to cover the cost of unpaid medical bills. Bills accrued by people like Janet Johnson. You don't want to do it, but sometimes you have to do it. She lost her job of 20 years, and with it, her health insurance. She has a life-threatening heart condition following three strokes. I walked out the door and just like all my breathing stopped and they called 911 and got me to the hospital. One minute I'm breathing and the next minute it's gone. I ended up over here. Janet was hospitalized multiple times in the more than two years she was uninsured. Do you know what kind of bills you're looking at here? What, $30,000, $40,000? And do you have a way to pay that no, much? Not at all, yeah. but like I said, you have to do what you got to do. Well, when you can't breathe, you really don't care. You know, all you can think of is, get me some oxygen. I need some oxygen right now. Janet eventually enrolled in a private plan through the Affordable Care Act, but it came too late for the staggering bills she had racked up while uninsured. Who ends up paying the tab for uncompensated care? Where do they get their money? They get their money from our property taxes. And when conservatives argue, let's not opt in, let's leave the money in D.C., then what conservatives are saying to the people in the state of Texas, to homeowners and to businesses, we want you to pay more for this uncompensated care. To me, that is not a conservative principle. As one of the U.S. congressmen most vocally opposed to the Affordable Care Act, we wanted to ask Texas Senator Ted Cruz about his resistance to Medicaid expansion. While his office declined an interview, we found him greeting his constituents. Hey, Senator Cruz, can we get a quick question before the coffee? We got to do it. Want to ask you about the ACA? So, hey, Senator, how about one one answer on Medicaid expansion? Over a million Texans without health care insurance because of. Texas opting out of Medicaid expansion. There is no doubt we need to expand access to health care. <laughs> Expanding Medicaid is an exceptionally poor way to do so. It's got to be better than nothing for the million Texans who don't have health insurance, though, right? Actually, if you look at the data, in the states that have expanded Medicaid, what happens is people get crowded out of the private health insurance market. And they end up, end up getting worse health care. Senator Cruz never directly answered our question about what to do with those million Texans who fall in the coverage gap. And for the people we met in Texas and across the country, there is no marketplace to be crowded out of. They're stuck on the outside looking in. And at this point, Congress is not listening to the people who are hurting. Well, couldn't Texas negotiate for the money, though? Come up with a Texas solution? It's phenomenal to me that in the great state of Texas, we can let people fall through such a big crack. And so Texas has made a choice. If you were in South Carolina, if you were in North Carolina, uh, if you were in Mississippi or Alabama or Louisiana or Florida, you would be seeing the same thing right now. The system could help us if they would be willing to actually come to an agreement. And because they, they aren't, we're, there are people like me out there who are literally dying because they don't have the care. 